From Ponce de Leon to Nancy Pelosi, the quest for a fountain of youth has proven to be a fruitless effort. But what if there was a way to prevent the aging of a simple cell? Could that prevent the aging of a single person or an entire population? I'm Danica Quinn for PJTV. Joining me now from our New York studio is Michael West, CEO of Biotime Incorporated, and his corporation just released the results of a new study in the emerging field of regenerative medicine. Welcome to PJTV. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you. Dr. West, let's start with some background on the science and the difference between mortal and immortal cells. Yeah, who would have thought that there were immortal cells in the human body? It sure doesn't seem that way, does it? No. Uh, but the, yeah, but the, the basic research in aging is called gerontology. And so, gosh, for about 150 years now, uh, science has known that there uh, is, a, in a sense, an immortal type of a cell in the human body. By immortal, we mean a cell that doesn't have to age. And uh, I guess two seconds, you can probably figure out what those cells are. There are reproductive cells. Uh, we, we make babies, and our babies have then reproductive cells that make babies. Uh, looking back in time, we're made of a lineage of cells that have not died in the history of life on Earth and that have made you and me. The cells in our body, though, are different. Our, our body cells are called somatic cells and they all have a genetic clock of aging that uh, ultimately you know, means the demise of you and me. So those are called mortal cells. The cells in our reproductive lineage are called immortal cells. And what exactly have you discovered in your study? Well, based on some research that's been done in the United States over the last 15 years or so, sponsored by the National Institutes on Aging, uh, we've come to learn the molecular clock that causes our body cells to age. It's actually at the ends of our DNA strands, a region called the telomere, which means end part in uh, Greek. Okay. And uh, so telomeres shorten in our body cells over time. And the exciting news to get to the punchline is we just published in a scientific paper uh, yesterday uh, that by manipulating some genes that are normally present only in this reproductive lineage of cells, mm -hmm. we can turn on certain genes that cause cells to go back in biological time, resetting the clock of aging, kind of like a key that winds an old antique clock, you know? Right. And taking the cells back to a state of total power where they can make all the cells of the human body, similar to these embryonic stem cells we've heard so much about, but without making embryos or using embryos. So the net result is we have now a, uh, a new way to turn back, as you said uh, in your intro, the clock of aging in cells uh, in a very profound and exciting biological sense. And we think that will have profound impact on medicine in the future. Unbelievable. Could you please explain for myself and our viewers, how do cells age in a normal human body? Yeah, so what happens is to maintain life, uh, some of our cells need to replicate and turn over. You know, uh, our hair growing is, our hair is made of cells. Mm -hmm. So our body's full of cells that in order to maintain us in a healthy state, cells need to replicate, divide. One cell becomes two, two become four, and so on. And that constant turnover of cells uh, leads to a ticking of the clock, or every time a cell divides, this telomere gets shorter. And so there's a sort of a genetic time bomb, to use a, a b bad uh, terminology, it, within all the cells in our body. And so no matter what we do in regard to exercise or diet, there's underneath all that, there's this genetic clock of aging. And the good news is, though, as I've, I've suggested, basic science now has led to an understanding of how that genetic clock of aging works. Uh, and that's, that's the good news and a way of intervening in it. Right. So how easy is it to reverse time's arrow, so to speak? How, and then how exactly does this work? Is there surgery or a pill that people can just take? Yeah, well, the way I think it will actually play out in the future is uh, very similar to the experiment that we published today in the paper, uh, but on a larger scale. And so let's say um, the primary target, by the way, are the chronic debilitating diseases of aging, not necessarily just aging itself. So, um, you know, ar arthritis, the kind of arthritis you get in aging, or heart failure, uh, the number one killer in the United States. 
or Parkinson's, or whatever the disease is. Let's say you're a patient, you come into the clinic, uh, and we say, you know what, you, you really, we need to repair and regenerate that cartilage. The cells are old and worn out. So we're going to take some living cells from you, uh, maybe like a blood draw, you know, and use the same technique that we would published or something very similar to it, and take the cells back in biological time to the cells that we were born from. And that, that's the miracle, as you just said, that's, that's biological time in reverse. Who would have thought that that would have been possible? And then turn them into the young cells you need, cartilage, heart muscle, and regenerate your body with new young cells, uh, uh, potentially of any kind. And that's what we call regenerative medicine, which is, we think, the therapy of the future. Well, sign me up. <laughs> How important okay. is it that all of this is done without the use of embryonic stem cells? Well, you know, uh, first, there's an advantage to this technique in regard to making them your own cells, and um, that's very important because the body uh, rejects oftentimes cells that are not your own. You know, that's a major problem medicine's faced for years in transplant medicine. And the existing embryonic stem cell lines that President Bush uh, approved, for instance, in 2001, were not you or me. So they're not that useful in that respect. From the ethics standpoint, and I alluded to this briefly, the technologies I've just described do not necessitate the use of human embryos, uh, which about 30% of the U.S. population are vociferously opposed to. And of course, in medicine, we're trying to develop these technologies for all people. So in as much as some 30% of the population would object to the use of uh, uh, embryos in, in this technology, we've solved that problem with these new technologies. How close are you to clinical trials? You know, that's, I guess, the, uh, the remaining hurdle. Uh, it reminds me of is the back in the 60s uh, when President Kennedy uh, went before the American people and said, you know, within 10 years, uh, I want to put a man on the moon. We have the technology. You know, beforehand, he consulted with the leading scientists of his day, and they said, yeah, you know, we know how to build the propellants and the rockets and the guidance systems, and yeah, we could do this. It'll take a lot of people, Mr. President. Well, in the same way, we have a national urgency right now. We have this baby boom population about 10 years away from costing our country trillions of dollars in health care okay. expenditures. And... Uh, you know, yes, we can do this. We've got the technology, but it will take a lot of people. And so the, how many years to the clinic for any one particular application, like heart failure, the number one killer in the United States, all, the, all these applications are uh, depend, how fast we get to them is dependent on the number of scientists that can be hired and put to work. And so that's really dependent upon capital, or federal funding through the National Institutes of Health and that sort of thing. So the, right. the timeline is entirely dependent on people. Well, since we're on the topic of baby boom uh, generation, do you think that the unintended consequences here might lead to greater suffering from aging and a greater economic burden from having a larger, older population? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. And actually, I think the uh, answer is counterintuitive here. The, the way we age today, just naturally, uh, is not pretty. Uh, if you walk right. into a nursing home today, you'll see you know, urinary incontinence, Alzheimer's disease, painful arthritis, uh, you know, angina from coronary disease, and so on. The way we age today with these chronic diseases that can take 10 or even longer years uh, before the person finally dies are very expensive, you know, cause a lot of human suffering. What the first applications we think of these new technologies designed to intervene fundamentally in the mechanisms of aging will be targeted to these chronic debilitating diseases uh, to allow us to increase our health span, as we say. You know, lifespan is second in priority. Uh, it would be great if we could increase the human lifespan, but we want to increase the number of years people can live free of these chronic and debilitating diseases of aging. Right. How is your study being received in the media? Well, I think uh, with uh, open arms, and for the most part, um, I, I think uh, one aspect of this technology is, is that science is several years uh, ahead 
of the public's perception of where technology is. And so when we announced that we'd successfully reversed the developmental aging of human cells, taking them both back to an embryonic state and resetting this clock of aging, uh, you know, I got quite a few emails saying, you know, Mike, is this an April Fool's joke? Is this real? <laughs> is science really at that point? We didn't even have any right. idea. And so this is why uh, I'm here today. I think the scientific community needs to communicate this because it's more than just the advance of science at stake. Yes. As I said, this is a national policy issue with the aging population today. Thank you so much for being on PJTV today, Dr. West. To learn more about Michael's company, Biotime, and to learn more about the study, log on to biotimeinc.com.